human rights is something to do with the nature of human dignity. Human rights is a discourse which deals with those aspects of our humanity which need to be at all costs and in all circumstances protected. And it is, I think, quite important to recognize that the origins of our language about human rights are less about entitlement than about protection. And it may do us good to come back to that point. What the language of human rights needs to focus on in this particular intellectual tradition is the protection of every human being from claims on them by others to control their future, to dictate their well-being, and so forth. In that sense, as with so many legal questions, the essential nature of what's being argued for is negative or reactive. Protection, avoidance, the defense of human dignity against various kinds of threat to it. That, I think, is very near the heart of what the Christian theological tradition and ethical tradition in the Middle Ages delivers on this subject. And it's a theme that's been worked out with great sophistication and most interestingly by the Roman Catholic theologian Roger Ruston. To come at it from that point of view is to remind ourselves that the language of rights as entitlement is a somewhat one-sided picture of what this discourse is most deeply about. <coughs> That's not to say that the issue of entitlement is unimportant or to be ignored, and I'll come back to that very briefly later on. But as soon as we begin to, to think and speak of human rights in terms of defense, in terms of protection, in terms of that negative warding off of those things which severely limit one's access to social life and shared welfare, I think we have a response to some of the criticisms and some of the suspicions that are raised about this kind of language. Now, in fact, speaking of human rights in this sort of way is not to do very much more than to speak about what the rule of law itself means. Law is fundamentally, before it's anything else, a negative thing. Law <coughs> protects, law reacts, law defends. Equality before the law does not mean equal entitlements in the eyes of the law. It means equal access to redress for injury, equal expectation that injustice is rectified, an equality as part of a conversation and exchange in society in which everyone's voice is protected as contributing to the social exchange. When law steps beyond that, when law attempts to legislate in the interests of one group, when it attempts to intervene too proactively in social custom and usage, it loses some of its legitimacy. But that's another question, and a very substantial and rather complicated one, which I'll spare you and myself this afternoon. Now, this, in turn, prompts what I think are some very interesting and very serious questions about the relationship between democracy and human rights. I said earlier that the tendency is to roll together democracy and human rights as one thing. But if by democracy we simply understand the governance of the majority, we obviously have a problem. As soon as we bracket human rights with democracy, we are saying democracy is more than just popular legitimacy. A legitimate democratic government is not just one that happens to have a majority vote. A legitimate democratic government is one that operates the rule of law, 
which defends or protects human right and human dignity for all its citizens. And that's a point which needs making, I think, again and again. It is so easy to slip into a definition of democracy, purely and simply, in terms of what I call popular legitimacy, the majority vote. A sensible, ethically and theologically informed approach to democracy will indeed agree that democracy and human rights has to be bundled up together, with the one carefully qualifying the other, so that the test of a legitimate democracy becomes not solely its electoral mandate, but its congruence with and faithfulness to the rule of law in the sense of an expressed, robust willingness to defend everyone's access to the social space, to social good, to shared welfare. And that is where one of the tests of a legitimate democracy is precisely how it deals with its minorities. I hear and accept the ambiguity of the word minority as it's applied in the Middle Eastern context. And I've had my wrist very firmly slapped on occasion for using this term without due sensitivity to some of those in the region who feel that it is potentially a demeaning word. I hope I may be forgiven for using it as a shorthand on this occasion, it being understood that I realize why it's a problem. <coughs> the point is simply that if a democracy is indeed to be tested as to its legitimacy in respect of how it treats those other than the majority, those who are numerically not in control, then paradoxical, paradoxical as it may sound, a good democracy is precisely not one that appeals only to majority legitima legitimation. And part of, I would say, the religious and the ethical perspective that has to be brought to bear on nascent and growing democracies is the question, not just are these governments the product of popular election, but are they developing with respect for the rule of law and with a commitment to the protection of everyone's dignity? Now, there's a great deal more that could be said about this, and I hope you'll forgive me for not going into further detail about it. But it helps, I think, get a little bit of a perspective on a couple of other issues which I want to touch on and suggest for discussion before I conclude. To speak in these terms of a legitimate democracy as one that is committed to the rule of law for all its citizens, never mind the popular vote in itself, is to say every human being is owed, and I would allow an element of entitlement there, is owed a social and political environment in which their identity as a citizen is defended. They are part of a community which is not defined by this or that majority, by this or that particular group. They are part of a community whose identity is defined by a shared civic dignity. A shared civic dignity. <coughs> a democracy, in my sense, and I hope not just mine, is a polity where everyone knows that they have an identity which the law protects, which they do not have to fight for, and which is not at the mercy of this or that majority, this or that interest group, this or that religious group, taking power, exercising executive authority. And there are two sides to this, which I think are very interesting in the context of modern politics. It is, I would say, absolutely crucial that a healthy polity, a healthy social and political order should establish very firmly that shared civic identity. It's also crucial, as I've argued in various places, that it's recognized that that civic identity is not the only one that people have. 
In other words, a person may be a citizen with guaranteed legal rights in all respects. And a person may also be a Christian, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Druze, or whatever it may be, following the custom of their community and willingly accepting some of its disciplines. Problems come when, on the one hand, you have an aggressive secularist polity which says we don't recognize any identity except the civic and the legal, and your religious opinions are entirely private and unimportant for public purposes. Or on the other hand, where a polity emerges that says the only identity that matters is your religious identity, and if you happen to belong to a religious minority, then you won't even be granted civic dignity. There are two kinds of threat, a kind of political pincer movement, as you might say, from secularism and confessionalism. The democratic state, the just democratic state under the rule of law, shuts its eyes and ears to these seductions on either side and attempts to move forward, saying we will respect universal civic dignity and we will respect communal diversity at the same time. And while that is notoriously hard work, it is, to paraphrase Winston Churchill's famous characterization of democracy, the worst possible system except for all the others. Now we see, of course, in our modern world, examples of both the distortions I've spoken of. We see societies where confessional identity again and again seems to wish to squeeze out the actual diversity of people and their universal rights as citizens. And I can remember some of the most interesting discussions I had a few years ago in Pakistan with a number of people in government and elsewhere being about precisely this issue. What is it in a state like Pakistan that secures absolutely and beyond question the equal civic dignity of all citizens, even in a state that is professedly and confessionally Muslim? Because that is the task Pakistan historically set itself. And yet the confessional temptation has recurred again and again, as many Pakistani Muslims will confirm. We needn't look too far afield in the Middle East and the rest of the region we're considering to see how some of those tensions and temptations are around there. Equally, and I was grateful to have a, an illuminating conversation over lunch on this subject, the effect of many years of Kemalist secularism in Turkey has been to produce a deep resentment among those religious communities which have felt marginalized by a long, persistent, and sometimes extremely authoritarian public secularism, which has made what you might call grassroots Muslim communities deeply suspicious and hostile to the very idea of secular civic dignity. And some of the problems we're seeing at the moment in Turkey seem to be connected with that standoff. So I'm suggesting that one of the things the church's historic understanding which underlies human rights discourse has to offer in the present moment is that it helps us identify those two problematic extremes. A preoccupation with civic dignity which simply ignores religious diversity and the depth and variety of religious commitment a temptation to confessional homogeneity which tries to or is tempted to remove even civic liberties from religious minorities. In between stands legal democracy, democracy that protects, democracy whose legitimacy, moral and political, is tested by its capacity and willingness guarantee, as I've said, equal civic dignity for all. Two other issues to touch on very briefly. One is the rather obvious question of why it is that 
confessional exclusivism and the violence that often goes with it is so attractive. Clearly, this is a world in which globalization threatens and undermines all kinds of local identities, traditional, communal senses of belonging. It's a world which makes it very easy for some communities and some nations to feel that they are being swept up in an irresistible tide of assimilation to certain values and practices associated with the North Atlantic world. There's every reason for resistance to this, so people feel, and that, as we know, fuels some of the violence and some of the bitterness that's around. But I think that violence and that bitterness might be just a little less sharply defined were societies like this to have themselves a more robust sense of what civic dignity might mean, a more robust secular affirmation of law and rights in the senses I've been discussing. In other words, a traditional society, a religious community, may very well and very understandably feel under threat from globalization. It is perhaps that much less likely to resort to violence and resentment if it is able to develop a polity in which the diversity of religious practice is genuinely respected, in which custom and tradition are not undermined, but in which civic dignity is clearly secured by an accountable form of government. And it's that latter commitment, which of course we don't see in many societies now dissolving under the pressures I've mentioned. The last point to touch on in this connection is just to note that, of course, no major religious community in our world is, in fact, homogeneous. All Christians think, no, they don't. All Muslims believe, well, probably not. All Jews agree that. Famous rabbinic saying that where you have three rabbis, you have four opinions. <laughs> All Buddhists believe, one can go on. Every religious community is, in fact, much more diverse than many of its ideologues would like to say and admit. But that means that within religious communities, there is also a challenge about how we treat our own minorities. Diversity within the religious community. Are we simply to see an accelerating sectarianism and separatism, which, because each religious community is diverse, leads to more and more splitting of territory, polity, resource? Or can religious communities themselves begin to model in their own treatment of their own minorities a good practice that the wider society can handle. I'm often struck and moved by the way in which the appalling pressures under which Christians live in the Holy Land has brought a quite new level of active and positive engagement between Christians of different confessions there. It seems possible for mutual respect and creative diversity to emerge and some of the meetings I've had the privilege of attending in Jerusalem over the years have suggested that there is indeed change and growth in that respect, which could be of signal importance for the long-term future. But I think it's also a challenge for the wider Christian and the wider Muslim world. How do those communities deal with internal diversity, internal minorities? How is justice and dignity secured within the community, not just between religious communities? I mention that because, of course, this is a very serious issue in the region under discussion. And I recollect a Christian friend of mine from Syria saying to me about two years ago, if 
the current regime falls, what we see is not only a more vulnerable position for Christians, but an implosion of Muslim communities in internal fighting between Sunni and Shia. Now that's a commonplace. Two years ago, I think it was a very prescient observation. That's why I mention the significance of how we deal with our internal minorities and our internal diversity. All I've done is to sketch a few very broad thoughts about the origins and the contours of the background to our modern discourse of human rights, attempting to locate that against something of a theological background. A background which affirms that there are certain things about human beings which are not at the mercy of changes of government. Certain proper expectations of security, of protection, of respect, which belong to human beings in right of their humanity and nothing else, absolutely nothing else. What has sometimes been called the naked humanity of human rights. Religious traditions, and I've spoken from the Christian perspective, but there would be parallels from elsewhere. <coughs> religious traditions have had good reason for affirming that dimension of humanity not subject to the next election or the next revolution. And they need to affirm it with just as great force, energy, and integrity now as ever, perhaps more so. And to speak in these terms, to speak of human rights as having to do with the protections and the redress that human beings can expect in situations of inequality and injustice, that surely is where the emphasis must lie in our understanding of what constitutes an ethical and legitimate democracy today. I've suggested one or two specific points in which this tradition has some light to cast or some points to suggest in the context of our present discussions of the details of Middle East and Sudanese and North African politics. And I hope that in this brief attempt to reconnect something of the language of religion with something of the language of human rights, there's been enough to stimulate some disagreement, some comment, and I hope some deepening of understanding, which will frame further discussion in the next 24 hours or so. Thank you very much indeed.